Hey everyone, welcome to this week's episode of the Health Via Mar Nutrition H Women Podcast. This is your host, Jeffrey Wu. And I've come across this next guest's work through a multiple number of mediums. So really excited to speak with them directly today. I want to welcome best-selling author and kind of human guinea pig, Max Lugavere. Great to have you in the program. Hey, thanks so much for having me, Jeffrey. What a, what a privilege it is to be here. 100%, 100%. So it sounds like we're mutual fans, but one of the things that I wanted to get like kind of the history was, obviously you've done best-selling books, you know, written across a number of health, wellness, performance topics, but what was that starting story? Were you a scientist, athlete? What kicked you off on this human performance journey? Yeah, I, I was not a scientist. I was not an athlete. I have always had a fascination for health and wellness uh, for as long as I can remember, actually. And I, it's, it began sometime mid-high school. I was sort of an introverted, shy computer nerd, um, I'm going to call myself, at the time. And I, wa- I went to high school in um, a neighborhood of Manhattan called Chelsea. And um, in that neighborhood, uh, I would walk home every every day after school. Again, you know, just try to picture me. I had braces. I had a horrible hairstyle. And I was very, you know, not confident when it came to my stature and the pecking order of high school, which I'm sure many people can relate to. And uh, there was this, I saw one day I was walking down sort of a different path that I, that I normally took to get home. And I saw this tiny little supplement store that I walked into. It was like a sports supplement store and there were posters on the wall of these like super jacked, you know, behemoth Adonis like men. And the the guy working behind the counter, I'll never remember his name, but he had a, a keen interest himself in the in the area. He wasn't just like uh, he wasn't just running the register. He was very interested in the topic and you could tell that from talking to him. And through that, I became really interested in the world of supplementation and fitness. I saw supplements, these potions, these powders on the walls as being uh, windows really to sort of optimize, you know, my, myself at the time, you know, this, this shy little kid. And so I kind of, having never really been interested in sports or athletics or anything like that, I kind of gravitated to weightlifting. And specifically, I became interested in bodybuilding. So I started to um, engage with some of the news groups at the time. This was in the late 90s. So, you know, we didn't have, uh, you know, really very many message boards or there was no social media. So I would, I would go to places like alt.bodybuilding. I think that's what they were called. And I just, I had this, this, this unyielding fixation, this fascination for, for fitness and for the, the things that you can sort of do in your life that have a measurable impact on how you look, how you feel, how you perform and it just sort of snowballed from there. So I remember in high school, I, you know, I tried all different kinds of crazy diets and I've always had a very good relationship with food. I just was very interested in kind of, you know, using myself as a guinea pig, as you alluded to. And I started engaging with different like supplement tactics. I also became very familiar with the ketogenic diet very early on. So this was in around 1998, 1999. I stumbled upon a book by Lyle McDonald called The Ketogenic Diet. And at that point, I, you know, I, I mean, I was very sort of well-versed in it for somebody who was like, you know, so young, uh, a, a, an early adopter, if you will. And so that kind of carried me through to the end of high school. And I started college as a pre-med um, student. Ultimately, I, I realized in school that I also had a passion for creativity and storytelling. So I didn't actually end up going the medical route, but that sort of remained a personal passion of mine for many, many years. And it, it sort of stayed with me through to my first job out of college, which was as a journalist. Um, I worked for a large TV and information uh, network in the U.S. directly under Al Gore, who was the chairman of the of the network, and I was a, a journalist. I got to sort of tell stories, which whatever I wanted to talk about, to a, an audience of 100 million people um, in the U.S., which was incredible. But then, a few years after that job ended, my my mother got sick. She developed a rare form of dementia, and it was the hardest thing that me or anybody in my family ever went through. And Having had that that passion for nutrition, for health um, in my back pocket and sort of having a framework for understanding science and some of the terms that would come up when researching um, these topics, I rolled up my sleeves and I, I really became, I guess you could say, an independent investigator to try to understand why this would have happened to a woman so young, what could be done to prevent it from happening to myself and others that I care about. And that I mean, I guess, you know, almost nine years ago began a journey that will continue with me until, you know, my last breath. 
my mom passed away uh, two years ago. Um, but understanding what it was that led to her sickness uh, has become something that I think is is my calling, is my is my purpose, my mission in life to try to understand how to live more healthily so that we can avert these kinds of illnesses, which are which afflict millions and millions of people worldwide. And so that that's really it. Cool. I mean, that's a lot, a lot to unpack there. But I want to zoom back in terms of the bodybuilding days, because that was not my entry point into the human performance at a house. But talking to folks that came from that world, these were like some of the most original quote unquote biohackers. Yeah. Tinkering with N equals one self experiments. Obviously, on the extracurricular supplemental side, you can go kind of legal supplements and then research chemicals and then known steroids and anabolics. I mean, there's a lot of tweaking and whether that's uh, more scientifically oriented ways of experimentation or very witch doctor like protocols in terms of how do you get super big and cut and all of that. But I think there's definitely, I would say, a stream of biohacking that really stem from that bodybuilding, weightlifting culture. Love to just hear anecdotes from that era. Like, were you, how experimental were you? Was this more on the things off the shelf or were there's like research chemicals? Because I know that when I entered the space of nootropics, cognitive performance, it definitely started off in like the research chemical world with like new PEPs and the Russian Alzheimer off-label drugs. Nothing like schedule illegal per se, but definitely on more of the off-label side of house. Curious, you know, what were some of those early experiments like? Yeah. First of all, I, I I actually completely agree with you. I think that bodybuilders are the ultimate biohackers. Um, and I still continue to think this. I still look at people with, you know, with these sort of body bodybuilder, like com competition level physiques, and I look at them in awe. And I'm not saying that I would ever want to personally go to those lengths. I actually, even when I was most interested in bodybuilding, I was not really, the end goal for me was never actually to compete. I never saw that as being something that I aspired to do, but I still look at them with, you know, tons of reverence uh, for the discipline that it takes to get into that shape. And the fact that they, you know, I mean, we talk about obviously biohacking all the time, but I mean, these guys have such an intricate knowledge of their own, like, water retention levels, you know, their hormones and preventing aromatization of, of different, you know, so it's like, it's really next level to me. And, and that's why I think it's so fascinating. So back when I first became interested in the topic, I, you know, I, I never actually, I, I've always really been interested in sort of the, the convergence of the teachings that you would learn from the bodybuilding school of thought you know, in relation to fitness and nutrition, but then also sort of marrying that with my, you know, a, a, a passion for health and wellness and well-being and longevity, which is something that I guess I've always had as well. So where I kind of sit philosophically is at the center of those two, that, you know, those two sort of, um, in that, in the center of that sort of Venn diagram. Yeah. I remember There's one of the definitely crazy... tension there. There's definitely tension there, I think, within the human performance biohacking community, right? Like yeah. performance and longevity sometimes are orthogonal or in opposition. Yeah. But, you know, I think that, you know, I, I do think that being fit and carrying as much muscle as your genetics allow and doing it in a way that's healthy and incorporates rest and relaxation and not becoming obsessive about it. But, you know, the sort of muscle centric approach, I actually think is quite beneficial from a, a health and longevity standpoint. In fact, I don't think that bodybuilders and, and fitness people really get their get their due in the biohacking space. Uh, and the longevity space. And of course, you know, the fitness space, I don't think pays enough attention to what we know about longevity and health span and all that stuff. So there's really this sort of like broken chain, this broken link between those two worlds. But for me, I like to sort of walk that gap. I mean, if, I, if there's anything that I think that's unique about my, my sort of offering to the space, it's that I am interested in sort of both. And I just sort of intuitively synthesize what I learn from each sort of side uh, and bring it together in a way that's practical and achievable for people. But speaking of, of not practical and not achievable, one of the craziest diets I ever did growing up, I did something that I, I read about, I think it was called the fat fast diet. And basically it was a very low calorie diet that, that basically was just two in, two things, flaxseed oil and whey protein powder. So that was pretty much it. So it was a very low carbohydrate diet, ketogenic diet, very low calorie, Insane, insane. I wouldn't recommend that to anybody. But uh, how many calories of that were you consuming a day? Was it like so, like five hundred calories of oil and protein? Or well, it was a very low calorie diet, but it was about I was getting about two hundred grams of protein a day, which we know that when you're in a hypocaloric state, you know when you're consuming 
at a calorie deficit, higher protein levels equates to better muscle retention. So I was eating enough protein in accordance with the evidence, certainly at the time, to maintain whatever muscle mass I had, but I was eating a very low calorie diet. And it's really not designed in any... First of all, nobody should do that diet, period. But even back then, I remember it was not designed to be something that you know, you stuck to long term because beyond like the multivitamin that you would take, I mean, that's a diet that basically sets yourself up for, you know, like anorexia in the true sense of the term, like, you know, malnutrition. And, you know, I, that, that didn't last very long for me, thankfully, you know, and again, I just, yeah, how long could you sustain that? I'm sure that probably got you cut up, right? Cause like, that's essentially, yeah, I, like, I think I did it for like, yeah, protein fast, essentially. <laughs> like, exactly. I think I did it for like a week and a half. And I just also want to underscore that I, I've, I've always had a very good relationship with food. I've just also all, also been interested in, you know, in tinkering and, and, you know, and things like that. Yeah. Maybe that's like, you mentioned that twice and maybe we should like talk about it. Cause I think, cause we, like, I talk a lot about fasting as well. And that's been like a common critique around like the Silicon Valley bros are fasting and we just uh, bring anorexia or eating disorders and mainstreaming it. And why is there like a different gendered lens between like women talking about fasting and men talking about fasting? Yeah. And maybe this is overly aggressive, but, and I'm curious to get your thoughts on this. Like my stance has been that the standard American diet is disordered. I mean, if the standard American diet is driving 75% overweight obesity, a third of us diabetic, pre-diabetic, like what, what is the standard of like, uh, a, a, like an orderly uh, mode of eating and of course like that's not to overlook that you know the i believe three percent or less of us who have eating disorders or problems with anorexia i don't think you or i are speaking towards that audience when we're talking about fasting correct or a health and eating habit but like i think what i'm mostly addressing are the dom the predominant the plurality of americans that are overweight looking to improve body composition. So I just want to put it out there in terms of not necessarily being apologetic around healthy relationship to food. I think this, our, our, our default has been so skewed. Yeah, I actually, I couldn't agree with you more. I, the only reason why I bring that up is because, you know, as somebody who's amassed, who's been lucky enough to amass a large audience and particularly, you know, one on Instagram where I post a lot of sort of very general uh, health memes. You know, what I have seen is that many, many women do have, you know, unhealthy relationships with food. And I want to be sensitive to that. And, uh, and I think that that's, that's kind of a tragedy. I also don't believe that, you know, that should preempt any, you know, discussion about empirical truths around nutrition and what it means to eat healthily. And, you know, being able to say, you know, this donut or this pizza or this whatever it happens to be is not the best choice for your health. So, you know, I've sort of become, I guess, a little bit honed by that experience. Um, and that's not my target uh, demographic um, or audience that, that I like to speak to. But, um, but I do, you know, I guess it's because uh, you kind of see that come up so much on social media, the fact that so many people have these like, you know, damaged relationships with food. And I do agree that there, you know, I guess as health educators, as health influencers, we can do a better job of, you know, being less dogmatic about, about, you know, our ways of eating. You know, I see a lot of people in the, in the health and wellness space, uh, especially, you know, with these more restrictive diets, like the carnivore diet and vegan diets and things like that really kind of present this air of perfection, you know, that if you're not like on this diet and doing it, you know, 100%, 100% of the time, then you're somehow messing up. And, you know, I like to talk about ideals, I write about ideals in my in my books, and things like that, I think it's important to know the rules. Uh, but that doesn't mean that I adhere to the rules all the time, personally, like, I certainly, you know, I believe that you have to know the rules to be able to then break them. But you have to know the rules. I think it's a fallacy that people that people know the rules. You know, I see a lot of, of people in the fitness community talking about calories in, calories out and things like that, but most people don't. I mean, when you when you look when you look outside of social media and you look outside of the people tracking the low carb high fat hashtags and things like that, people generally don't know anything really about nutrition, you know. So, for me, I think it's important to kind of talk about these ideals, um, but then also acknowledge the fact that it's okay to break them once in a while, you know, like no meal, no singular meal is going to improve your health or harm your health in any significant way. It's about the dietary pattern as a whole. It's about what you're doing every single day. It's about how you're living your life. It's about the, the consistent, it's about the choices that you make day in and day out. Yeah. And I think that's a similar journey that I've gone through where I think as 
you know, personally started doing longer fasts or doing a ketogenic diet. It was like very much like eat to the macros. And I think I had a similar realization as yourself, which is that as you then understand the fundamental mechanisms of why this metabolism or why this physiology is working in, a, in, in its way, then it's like, okay, like I can start playing around with the macro makeup or the calories, or if I'm going to do a workout, having a little bit of carbohydrate beforehand or, and start playing around with that. And I think we're absolutely right that the level of nutrition discourse needs to have a higher baseline so people can have some sense of what is even good. And then from there, I think, we, I don't think, yeah, no one is perfect. I think that's a thing. Like we, I'm sure you've spoken to a lot of the people that are like hundred percent carnivore or vegan and maybe like, but like, I think even when you talk to them on, in their personal lives, they're like much more, I think they, they'll take like, you know, much, I think much more pragmatic unless it's like for a strict religious reason or something. But I think people are just like realize that like, yeah, one time you're eating like a Snickers bar, it's not going to give you cancer. Right. It's just like, it's like holistic pattern of, of, of a lifestyle that really drives these chronic diseases, uh, not a, a one mistake over like years. Yeah, certainly. I've I've definitely become more more moderate in my approach. I mean, I still my my diet uh, recommendations. You know, I still consume a you know for the most part ninety nine percent of the time grain free diet, gluten free, limited dairy. Uh, although I do enjoy you know the occasional Greek yogurt or, or butter, and I, I use butter and ghee and whatnot. But yeah, I mean, I I tend to cater my diets my my diet to my activity levels. And just to offer an anecdote, you know, my workout routine has dramatically changed over the past couple of months because of COVID. So I don't have access to my gym anymore. But what I have started doing, I do a lot of calisthenics, but I've also taken up boxing lessons. And boxing, le I don't know if you have ever boxed, but it's a very high intensity anaerobic workout. And I typically would go to the gym and normally I, I enjoy a fasted workout. I find that working out fasted, I have this you know, this cocktail of, you know, hormones and neurotransmitters in my brain when I'm fasted that actually make me quite alert and quite strong. And actually, I feel quite motivated to, to exercise when I'm fasted because you want to get to the other side so that you can have food. But I found that when boxing fasted, I bonk actually without, you know, without having something in my stomach. And also I've noticed on, you know, in tandem with that, that if I consume carbohydrates beforehand, I tend to perform a lot more effortlessly like almost like a night and day difference. And I, I uh, hesitate to ascribe absolute certainty to the causal effect there because there are, there have been a few, you know, variables that change day to day, like the temperature in, in Los Angeles, for example. But, but yeah, I mean, I, I definitely like for this particular workout, I find that it's, it's been very useful for me to have carbohydrates beforehand, like a banana. Or yeah. Something like that. Interesting. Yeah. I had an experience training up for a charity boxing match with a friend and, uh, it's a different level of intensity from just a typical Olympic powerlifting workout, especially for, I don't know if you're sparring or, you know, trying to, or, or fighting or, or the intensity level there. But I just remember like in everyday life, you, you're not, you never like try to look in someone's eye with that kind of intensity. Cause like when, he hit me the first time I hit him first. I wanted to kill my, my friend essentially <laughs> in that ring. And I think like a lot of us don't ever have that animalistic primal, like fight for your existence experience that often. But, and, and I think fortunately so that we, that we've evolved a more civilized society where you never have to have that confrontational dynamic anymore. You know, most, most of the time, but I think in terms of speaking towards the anaerobic threshold, I mean, you're like, that's a level of intensity. That's like very hard to replicate if you're just like, listen to music or a podcast as you're lifting weights. So I can definitely see how having that, that, that glycogen reserve is helpful there. Yeah. You also, when you're working out with a trainer, you can't take breaks. You're the, the, the breaks that you take are preset. It's like 30 seconds per round, you know, that's like how between, round, yeah. between rounds or something like that. So whereas you may be able to complete the lesson with a longer break, you know, to allow for some degree of reglycogenation, maybe through, you know, gluconeogenesis or something, you're not giving your body the time to do that when you're in a, like working out with a trainer. Right. Um, so I just found it very, very interesting, yeah. um, you know, at the very least to, cool. uh, yeah. to, to experience that, you know? Yeah. I think I, I want to talk about kind of the workout protocols. Cause I think most, I think most of our listeners are probably have had to change their experience as well. And I think I've definitely also evolved my workouts as well. So here's the trade notes there, but we veered off a little on the diet front. We're talking about 
the flaxseed whey protein diet. Obviously, <laughs> I, and I think if you discover the ketogenic diet in 98, that's super early, right? I remember when I first started reading about the ketogenic diet, and this is probably five, six years ago now, the first result that came up for ketones was diabetic, diabetic ketoacidosis, which is a de, kind of a deficient degenerate state for type 1 diabetics where you have uncontrollable ketogenesis. So like the first Google result at the time was literally like ketosis is bad. If you have ketones in your, in your pee, like go see a doctor because you have ketoacidosis. So I'm curious when you were first entering the topic, I mean, you know, basically, you know, 10, 15 years even earlier, what was that like? Yeah, well, I, I certainly wasn't interested in brain health at the time, um, you know, and and because of my mom's illness, you know, my real passion has has sort of narrowed down to dementia prevention and um, longevity, increasing our collective health span and things like that. But at the time, I just thought it was a cool means of losing weight and doing so in a way that was not as painful as counting calories and abiding by the whole if it fits your macros protocol. So, you know, the idea that you could basically eat to satiety on a ketogenic diet to me was very enticing, uh, which you can ab absolutely do because on a ketogenic diet, you're eating fat and protein. Those are the two most satiating macronutrients essentially. And so you're eating to satiety on a ketogenic diet and that allows you to still come in at a calorie deficit, which is going to allow you to lose weight. You also feel great. You feel, you know, your energy levels are a lot more stable, particularly after you get over the initial hump, if you've been on a more sort of, you know, high, high carb standard American diet. And so it was just, um, it was, uh, it was a very enticing proposition to me. And I also found it fascinating that, you know, we have essentially a metabolic switch in our bodies. I mean, you can't see it, but you can turn it on by, or you can, you can toggle it by, you know, just altering the mixture of macronutrients that you choose to consume. So that was just very interesting to me from a, just from an intellectual standpoint. But that was probably the last time, you know, early high school or, or I should say mid high school was probably, you know, when I was most interested in the ketogenic diet. And I didn't become interested in it again until my mother got sick. And I started looking, looking into the medical literature and I discovered its relevance for nerds generation and as a potential therapeutic diet for people with, you know, neurocognitive disorders. I mean, we know that the ketogenic diet has been used for a century at this point to treat, you know, certain types of epilepsy. But when that, when I started to read about the ketogenic diet in regards to certain types of dementia, it just, you know, I almost had to chuckle, even though it was a very traumatic time for me, because this thing that I had read about and been so interested in, in the context of body composition and fitness might actually be used to help my mom, you know, p potentially. Uh, I just thought that was a, it was just an interesting way to sort of come full circle, you know, and those moments are always, are always great. Yeah. That is kind of a funny way to, to think about because I, my suspicion in, from which I think a lot of people today hear about the ketogenic diet is Kim Kardashian talking about her keto diet. And I think it's funny that, I mean, it's, I think body comp and weight management is super important, but I think some of the more interesting applications are neurocognitive impact and some of the longevity research being done around ketosis as well. So it is, I mean, I, I, from my perspective, it's like a great entry point in education. I don't care if Kim Kardashian is like helping people come into the funnel, but if we just get people healthier or at least just have people reduce refined carbohydrate intake, maybe that's like the least controversial way to just even frame like one dogmatic Kind of principle out there that seems to be just generally good if we can like some, someone get the message out there so yeah like sounds like you were pr like fairly experimental and then what got you down the path as you were you know writing your books in, in terms of consolidating the genius foods in in your current protocol can you walk us through kind of the experiments and how you narrowed down into your current protocol which it sounds like you you cut out a lot of kind of the the grains and the glutens what drove those insights or decisions and what does that diet look like today? Yeah. So, I mean, I take a pretty, I think, balanced approach. You know, I, the diet that I, that I think is most optimal for me and certainly, you know, at this point, because my books have gotten out to so many thousands of people, I can also speak with some degree of certainty that it works for others that follow me. Um, it's a diet that allows for intermittent ketosis. So this is not a diet that, you know, what I, what I do, I'm not striving to always be in ketosis. I'm not, I don't really test myself or anything like that, but I think it's probably worthwhile to, to sort of be, you know, 
in to, at some degree in some in some kind of glycogen depleted state, you know, whether it's we're talking about muscle tissue or liver, so as to intermittently allow our brain dalliances into this ketogenic state so that it, you know, at, at least some of the time, whether it's daily, whether it's weekly, whether it's seasonally, can can basically partake in the utilization of these beneficial, this beneficial fuel source, you know, this super fuel, if you will, ket- you know, ketones. Some people's brains, you know, have trouble utilizing glucose, which is sort of the primary fuel source of the brain from a very young age. I believe the data suggests that people in their twenties that have the most, that carry the most well-defined Alzheimer's risk gene, the APOE4 allele, have deficits by about 10% in terms of their glucose utilization as uh, demonstrated in um, FTG PET scans. And so that doesn't necessarily correlate to any kind of decrement in their cognitive function. But, you know, we know that ketones are not just a fuel source to the brain, but they're a signaling molecule. They increase blood flow to the brain. They can upregulate uh, levels of BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor. So these are all, you know, n- this is a neuroprotective sort of cocktail uh, or cascade of events that I think follows when when you allow the sort of ketone pipeline to be turned on. If I'm, you know, over the course of the day, if I'm, as I mentioned, you know, engaging in high intensity exercise, I'm going to eat, you know, dense sources of carbohydrates in a way that's commensurate with my activity levels. So, you know, I'll titrate up if I'm doing high intensity exercise and I need that, you know, that stored fuel for, for high intensity glycolytic exercise, but then I'll titrate it down if I'm just sitting around all day and not doing much of anything. I also think generally that carbohydrates, you know, if you're getting them primarily from whole foods, then that's a lot different than getting them from ultra processed foods, which typify the standard American diet. So, you know, whole fruits, you know, I'll eat in moderation, things like that. But again, if you're, if you're sort of going about your day in, you know, even a moderately glycogen depleted state, then you at least have a vessel to store any carbohydrates that you're going to be consuming. You know, the 20 grams of, of, you know, glucose and fructose that I consume in a honey crisp apple, at least that sugar has a, has a vessel to, to go to, you know, a sink to be stored in because I'm not, eating 300 grams of carbohydrates every single day, like your average Westerner does. So it's sort of through that lens, you know, it's a, it's a lower carbohydrate diet. I also, you know, I think we ought to talk about like meat versus plants. You know, there's a lot of people that sort of fight on, on either side. I think for a person who is generally healthy, um, and has a, has a robust immune system and who's not suffering from active autoimmunity, that plants strengthen the, strengthen the system. And when it comes to brain health, you know, we, the best evidence, the best available evidence that we have suggests that people who incorporate plants, dark leafy greens, berries, things like that seem to have the best brain health. And so those are, you know, to be fair, usually observational studies that, that show us that, but still, you know, I don't think that, um, yeah, I just think from a, from, from the standpoint of, you know, the microbiota, the, you know, the various phytochemicals that we get from, you know, produce, extra virgin olive oil, things like that. Definitely worth including in the diet, but I'm also a huge advocate of meat consumption as well. So, you know, I, I, I try to incorporate both and that's sort of like the basis. Like what I've tried to do is I've tried to take the foods that I think have the most, um, are going to give you the most bang for your buck in terms of neuroprotective molecules, um, in terms of their satiety inducing potential. And I've called them genius foods in my book because, you know, I really chose to spell it out for people to make it easy so that you know when you're going to the supermarket what to stock up on. There was a study that came out of, I believe it was Tulane University. It was Darius Mozafarian uh, was the was the lead researcher. He found that people who abide by the eat everything in moderation advice, which I'm sure you know and your listeners know is terrible advice, actually leads to more poor choices when it comes to, you know, grocery shopping. Um, but the healthiest people, like I'm sure you, me, we tend to buy the same foods on loop, you know, we'll kind of venture out of our comfort zone occasionally to try something new and novel. But if I, you know, every week that I go to, or every, every other day that I go to the supermarket, I tend to buy the same things. I just stock up on like the usual suspects. Yeah. hundred percent. I think, and that, and that works for and me. I think, I mean, I have nothing to disagree in terms of your personal protocol. It's actually very similar to what I personally practice in terms of intermittently dipping into ketosis and dialing up and titrating carbohydrate in terms of activity. I think that's like 
usually quite sensible for people that want to optimize for both performance and longevity, where I think there are edge cases where you might therapeutically want to be in permanent ketosis, right? Like there, I think certain potential chronic diseases or conditions that might benefit from that kind of state. And I think it's a, I think you have a fairly, I mean, I think a balanced, I think of the omnivorous like ancestral diet that we are, all of our ancestors came from. Right. I, I think there's a lot of, I think, recent conversation or arguing between the vegans and the carnivores. And it's like, I don't think either <laughs> is as ancestrally consistent. And I think you're absolutely right that if they don't have any autoimmune issues, then there's no reason why a healthy human cannot be able to tolerate and enjoy fruits and vegetables. Yeah. I mean, personally, I think it's probably better for you and more evolutionarily, you know, logical that a car that a nose to tail carnivore diet would be better for you than a vegan diet. Yes, I would agree with um, that. So for that reason, I'm... I would say that I'm more carnivore adjacent than I am like vegan adjacent. But yeah, I do think that, you know, what we see in the carnivore community, we see a lot of people who've struggled with major health conditions, you know, that see a reprieve from symptoms when they cut out various, you know, plant materials that can induce what's called molecular mimicry and confuse an already confused immune system. But I, you know, I mean, I certainly took antibiotics growing up, but I haven't in a number of years and I was born vaginally and I, you know, I, I don't really live an overly sterile life or anything like that. So, I mean, and I don't have, I don't have autoimmune, you know, anything that I know of going on. So for me, I feel like in a, in a system that's already strong, those hormetic plant compounds, I think can strengthen an already strong system. But if you're below that threshold of robustness, which I guess for our definite, you know, for purposes of this conversation, we could say, if you're having active autoimmunity, then I can understand, I can, I can, understand the rationale behind why cutting those plants out at least for a time would be would be beneficial yeah i i agree with you there completely anything else in terms of particular foods that we would classify under you know kind of the umbrella term genius foods i mean it sounds like we're talking about the kind of the broad categories and the approaches but anything in particular in your research or in your own experimentation you thought like hey if there were superfoods, like, you know, these are definitely on my list that I could only be uh, for the rest of my life. And, and maybe this is going back to kind of the protocol of like having a consistency. What has made your daily, weekly shopping list? Yeah. I mean, I definitely buy some weird stuff. I love natto. Have you, are you familiar with natto? Yeah. I love natto too. Yeah. Fermented soybean, Japanese style. It's great. Yeah. Funky. Yeah. I mean, so, so some people would be like, Mac, you're eating soy. But it's, you know, I think like you've got to look at the, the, there's nuance. It's important. Like natto is an incredible food and, uh, and it's full of spermidine, natto kinase, vitamin K2. I mean, there's all these amazing longevity promoting compounds in natto. And so I, you know, I love that. I eat that whenever I have the opportunity. There's uh salmon roe I'm a huge fan of, um, which I buy, you know, regularly. I'm trying to think of like what's actually like in my kitchen right now. I mean, generally, I'm a huge consumer of grass-fed beef. I love you know grass-fed red meat. I think it's a, I think it's a superfood as much as you know anything else labeled a superfood. You know, in the supermarket. Yeah, I mean, I think I I think just pretty much what I eat tends to be meat and vegetables, and I generally prioritize the meat over the vegetables. Uh, but I think ve veggies are important for you know, dietary adherence. And I find that a lot of people, this is actually a funny observation. I find that a lot of people in the carnivore community, actually, they, these are the, I, I find that there's a, a cer certain persona in the carnivore, carnivore community of a guy who, you know, if he wasn't allowed to eat just meat, or if he wasn't sort of nutritionally curious, he'd, pr that he'd probably the kind of be the kind of person eating like what a 12 year old boy eats throughout <laughs> life. You know, you ever meet like, peers who basically eat the same things that they've been eating since they're 15, like pizzas yeah. and hot dogs and things like that. And their health is terrible. Yeah. I just feel like some of these people have just not had vegetables prepared properly. That's, that's my <laughs> hypothesis. And, uh, and you know, I love to make savory, you know, veggies and I, I cook all the time. Um, and so, yeah, I can't imagine a world where, you know, that would deprive me of some of the veggies that I, that I, that I cook. Um, I just yeah. think that they're, that they're have, have you done full carnivore blocks? I've experimented with a couple of cycles of like full carnivore for six to eight weeks, but I think I'm very much uh, aligned with you that I enjoy my veggies. I don't have any autoimmune issues. I, I really can't tell the difference between on or off vegetables or not. And, uh, 
Yeah, it's like it, there's like there, yeah, like a really nice garlic spinach or something just hits the spot sometimes. It just change it up from fatty ribeyes all the time. Like it's literally like a, a variety in terms of like just literally pleasure. Yeah, even at that that level, let alone like some of the actual longevity hormetic effects that you were mentioning in terms of phytonutrients. Yeah, I would like to. I mean, I don't doubt that in doing so, I would probably lose some fat mass. You know, I don't doubt that I would feel great on it physically. But what I do think would be the case is that I would get I would get bored of it and I would want to do it properly, you know, so I might try like a carnivore ish iteration of it. But you know, I enjoy coffee, I enjoy spices, um, and all those kinds of things. Like if you're, you know, if you're using them, then you're not fully adhering to the diet. So I just wonder, like, how I would set it up in a way to do it while still, you know, doing it in accordance with the way all the sort of carnivore gurus um, evangelize it, you know? Yeah, it's almost like anathema to have like that salt and pepper to season the steak. Right? <laughs> but yeah, but I would, I would be open to it. I would much sooner do that than like a, like a vegan diet, as I mentioned. Yeah. And I think you're spot on there in terms of at least it's plausible and it's like very, very sensible to get a nutritionally complete micro profile with, with, with animal products. It's very hard and basically impossible for like a lot of the B vitamins to do that on a pure vegan diet. So just from like a well, nutritional also- complete completion perspective. Yeah. I'm curious to get your thoughts on that. Oh, yeah. Also, I mean, vitamin C, you know, I know that if you consume certain organs fresh, they've got to be fresh, that there's a certain amount of vitamin C found in those organs. But I think the question remains as to whether or not that's optimal. I don't think so. Uh, I also would be very curious to know where these carnivores are getting their magnesium from. Just as an example, you know, magnesium is something that's found primarily in plant foods in almonds and dark chocolate and dark leafy greens and things like that. It's, it's wildly important. You know, it's a cofactor used in hundreds of enzymatic processes in the body that range from energy generation to, uh, DNA repair to vitamin D utilization. So where, where are you getting that from? If not plant foods, you know, I don't know. So arguing from their perspective, they would say they would eat bones or chew on bones and get some of the (laughs) mineral content from like gnawing on kind of like, uh, the bone marrow. So I, yeah. so I, yeah, so that would potentially be one explanation from the carnivore side. Interesting. I, I haven't heard that, but I would, I mean, that that's cool. I don't know yeah. the mag, the magnesium. I know that magnesium is stored in bones actually. So that, yeah. that makes sense. But I wonder how to chew on bones. I wonder that just a, it doesn't seem good for your teeth. Um, but. <laughs> well, I'm, t- I'm thinking like chicken bones, right? Like you can definitely gnaw on some of the smaller chicken bones or fish bones. Again, it might not be the most delicious thing possible, but I've had some like fried Japanese style fish bones that were like kind of crunchy and, and quite flavorful. So well, you it's eat possible. You, yeah. You eat bones when you eat sardines. So I wonder, I wonder if sardines are a good magnesium source then. Yeah. Yeah. That would be something to look into. Cool. I mean, what, so in terms of kind of future or, or experimental diets, just given kind of the state of the community as is, anything that you mentioned potentially trying a carnivore-ish nutrition block what has been interesting in terms of your literature or research today that you think compel- especially compelling or interesting, at least from the, uh, the diet nutrition side? Yeah. Today, um, I mean, as of this week and the past couple of months, I've been very interested in nitric oxide. And uh, nitric oxide is basically a gas that we create um, in our mouths uh, when we chew different kinds of vegetables, um, actually, primarily. Uh, and we also create it in the paranasal sinus in the endothelial cells that basically line the blood vessels of the, you know, the, the caverns around our nose. And there's an enzyme in there called nitric oxide synthase. And when we inhale, we're basically creating this gas and it helps to oxygenate our blood in a way that's much more efficient than when we inhale through our mouths. And so I'm very interested in nitric oxide as a way of reducing blood pressure of, you know, dilating our blood vessels, increasing blood flow to various organs, including our, including our brains. And also nitric oxide is a signaling molecule that's used in, well, I mean, a number of different applications in the body, but it also helps improve insulin sensitivity. And so in sort of becoming more interested in this, in this molecule, I've looked to way, looked at ways of, of optimizing it. And I found I've made some very interesting uh, discoveries that I think um, are worth talking about. So for one, um, a lot of people use mouthwash, antiseptic mouthwash regularly. Um, And what you're doing when you use antiseptic mouthwash is you're killing the the beneficial bacteria in your mouth that create this gas. So there's been a very interesting line of research that suggested that people who habitually use 
antiseptic mouthwash have increased risk for hypertension, for type 2 diabetes. And that, you, it just like logically, it doesn't make any sense until you realize that we have a microbiome in our mouths. And that microbiome, you know, is creating all these beneficial compounds, just like the microbiome at the other end does. And so I think that's something that is really important, you know, for people that have high blood pressure, um, and they can't explain why stop using the mouthwash. Very, very important. And also there's all these other bound, you know, benefits that can, that can occur as well by boosting levels of nitric oxide. And we create nitric oxide when we chew for about 60 to 90 seconds, sources of, of, of nitrate. So beets is our sort of the classic example, but also arugula calorie for calorie has more nitrate than anything. And so you really want to chew slowly and about, I believe it's like 90 minutes after you, after you, you know, chew and then ultimately swallow, you're basically reaching like peak nitric oxide levels. So, you know, great as a potential, just general health booster, but who knows pre-workout, you know, eat that arugula on date night, you know, an hour or two before you guys like hit the sack could be, could be potentially beneficial, but to that end, I've also become really interested in nose breathing. And so I've been sort of more regularly using these nasal strips that I think most people kind of think of in terms of their ability to stop you from snoring. But I wear, I don't snore, but I wear them now when I go to sleep because they increase airflow through the paranasal sinus. And on top of that, I've begun uh, mouth taping. So this sounds, I know, like really crazy. But um, with that sort of nasal expander and the mouth tape, I've been having like the best sleep that I think I've had in a long time with these two things that's, on my face. Yeah, that's interesting. I've been looking to mouth taping. So I actually bought some mouth tape guys to like hold the mouth shut. But I haven't actually started measuring using that recently. But I think, yeah, there's very interesting. And I think that's also especially relevant with mask wearing. I mean, I think like obviously, like I think like the first level, like obviously masks prevent the aerosolization of when you breathe out or you're talking or you spit. But I think there's been like a deeper nuance to that question is that does that presence of a mask actually alter your nose and mouth breathing? And once you actually like are open to like kind of ignoring the politicization of masks or not masks, but actually think about the science around nose breathing versus mouth breathing, there's like a very interesting data around the parasympathetic or sympathetic response when you actually, you know, are primarily nose breather or a mouth breather. And I think that's been kind of an interesting area that I think a lot of people haven't been paying attention to, or when you talk about masks or not masks, they kind of automatically talk about it in terms of like, a, is this like a, you believe in COVID or not? And it's like, no, 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 let's just talk about like just nose breathing, mouth breathing. And I, I think it sounds like you've done, you know, quite a bit of homework here. There seems to be a lot of, compelling reason why we should all really be thoughtful about how do you actually breathe fully through your nose, uh, not only from a nitrous oxide perspective, but I'm sure it also triggers a number of other uh, cascading pathways as well. Yeah. Um, have you, I mean, have you looked at the other pathways as well in terms of the nose breathing perspective? Yeah, I, you know, I mean, I think that that's, I think the nitric oxide part is quite important. I also think the fact that, you know, when you breathe through your nose, you're, you're, you're warming and you're moisturizing the air that you inhale that that's, I think a crucial part of it. But I really think that the, that, you know, the main thing is that, well, there's all these benefits of breathing in through your nose and then breathing in through your mouth is you're not getting any of those same, same benefits, but you're also drying out your mouth, which can have downstream consequences as well. You know, whether it's allowing unhealthy bacteria to grow, uh, or the like. So I've just become a lot more sort of conscious of that. It's just, it's just very interesting because I thought, you know, I, n I really n never would have thought that there would have been any difference. I thought that there were just basically two comparable holes in your face that were essentially just a, a means to the same end, getting air into your lungs. Um, but that's not actually the case. I think there's also probably a, um, if I recall correctly, there's also an antibacterial and antiviral effect of, um, nitric oxide. And so it's one of the reasons why breathing in, breathing in through your nose actually can help protect you against pathogens as opposed to your mouth. So maybe there's a, there's a sort of COVID-19 prevention story there, you know, making sure that you, that we're continuing to breathe through our noses and not our mouths. Um, I haven't really done too deep a dive into that area, but yeah, needless to say that, that combination, it's actually blown my mind how 
how great yeah. it makes me feel and it's and to, it, to sleep like that. I was just saying it's so subtle too. And I think yeah, if our listeners right now are actually just thoughtful and, and just try breathing through your nose explicitly and then try to do five breaths breathing through your mouth, I feel like it's actually a pretty quick, acute calming effect. Like I, you actually materially feel different. Yeah. You activate your parasympathetic nervous system. The mere act of slowing your breath down does that. Humming also is another way to dr pretty dramatically increase nitric oxide, I think by 15 fold, if I recall correctly, humming, because it basically just vibrates, you know, that, that it, it, it basically vibrates the air over that, that portion of your, you know, of the, uh, of those nitric oxide producing endo endothelial cells. But I've also been actually using those, the nasal strips when I work out as well, like before those boxing exercises. And I try to do what I can to, to not breathe through my mouth for as long as possible. Um, and it seems to help. Yeah, seems no, to help that's, my performance. that's good inspiration for me to, you know, be a little bit more disciplined about that. I'm going to report in and let you know in terms of my experiments there. <laughs> yeah. Moving towards the exercise perspective, it sounds like you definitely had to adapt. You know, some of the things I've been looking into is actually been blood flow restriction, right? Cause I don't have access to my heavy weights either anymore. So I, I used to like to do power Olympic lifts. I think just like those compound lifts are, are, are awesome, but if you don't have access to a barbell. Well, what, what is like a second kind of like, what can you do as alternatives? So I think either calisthenics, I think boxing is like a great way to get that kind of anaerobic threshold. But I've been recently playing around with blood flow restriction. Have you, have you anything kind of crazy or experimental you've been trying beyond kind of the calisthenics and the boxing flank? I haven't done blood flow restriction, but I do know that there is some good data there. Um, I just haven't sort of dipped my toe into that pool yet. I've been, uh, you know, I've been doing a lot of sort of like explosive movements because I can't really, I don't have the means to increase the weight with what I'm doing, but I've been sort of trying to do more explosive style push-ups. I don't know the name for them, but you just sort of like do it in a way that your hands lift off the ground, jump squats and things like that. I also um, bought a jump rope, which seems like a fun little playground toy, but it's actually a very powerful, uh, workout tool. And it's also great for your, for cognitive health as well. You know, the coordination that it takes to be able to jump rope is something that as a non-athlete, even, even jumping rope was difficult for me, but I'm now able to do it. And so that's been very, very interesting. You know, I would say that's like one, one very interesting quarantine hack to, to get into is to get yourself a jump rope. You can do it pretty much anywhere. Yeah. I mean, just even to touch on that point, I think one thing that I think is a detriment to the standard gym rat workout is that a lot of those movements aren't very functional or there's no rhythm or consistency behind them. And I think when you're doing explosive, thoughtful, explosive movements, or when you're jumping, you have to hit a rhythm and you have to have that hand-eye coordination. I think those are much more functional and valuable exercises. Because so I, I, I think there's so many people that I think are, they, they have hypertrophy because they're big, but they're not very functionally strong. And I think, I mean, that might work for certain cases but i think for at least for myself i care about functional strength obviously the aesthetics are great too but you actually want to be functional at some at some level you can actually use that muscle in a coordinated way yeah and you can actually like jump rope like helps train super yeah jump rope jumping rope is is great and you also can achieve hypertrophy through a pretty wide repetition range um i think you know the common dogma is that between 10 to 12 reps is really, you know, the sort of sweet spot, but you can, you can achieve hypertrophy through a, a much wider, I think, repetition range than previously thought. Low reps, high reps, provided that you're doing it, you know, with intensity and, you know, almost up to failure. So for example, push-ups, I could generally do, you know, somewhere around 40 push-ups, something like that. And, uh, and what I'll do is I'll try a bunch of different variations on the push-ups. I'll do I think they're called, um, oh man, pike push-ups. Pike push-ups are great uh, where you sort of like angle your, you push your butt up and you sort of angle down so that you're getting like more of your upper pecs and your anterior delts. And you just slow down the rhythm or make it more explosive. And you can kind of like, you know, do what you can to kind of shrink the rep range to, you know, to to something that's, I think, a more a more intense range. And so I've, yeah, I've been doing like a lot of that. I think when gyms open up, I'm probably going to go back to my usual, like sort of bodybuilding style routine. Yeah. It's a good change up, right? Like, yeah. And then like, it feels like you've been, I mean, I think to be experimental, you have to be somewhat philosophical or, or at least work on the mental side as well. Obviously looking at cognitive performance and through your mother's sickness. I mean, it's, it's likely something that you thought a lot about. I'm curious in terms of the mindset or resilience front or the cognitive front, obviously this time it's been potentially challenging for a, a lot of folks, right? Socially somewhat isolated, 
potential business financial issues, let alone just being sick and, and, and you know, having and losing people. I'm curious, any realizations or philosophical updates as, as you're, you know, as we're all surviving through a pandemic? Such a good question. I think, you know, you have to have a philo- you have to have a guiding philosophy about, how, you know, how you show up in the world, how you show up to your friends, to your loved ones, to your relationships, to your business. And I think you also have to have a sort of guiding philosophy about how you approach nutrition and your your dietary choices. I think that there's there's an area in the fitness space or a dogma, I should say, that comes from the fitness community that everything really can be distilled down, boiled down to calories in, calories out. And I think that that works for some people in that in that space. Uh, but philosophically, I have a problem with that advice because I think it doesn't give average people in the real world functional tools with which to understand how food is going to affect their, not just their biology, but their behavior. And so for me, you know, having this sort of more philosophical approach, it's not a, it's not necessarily a data driven approach, but it's more, it's one guided more by the philosophy that, you know, people ought to have informed consent about the way that food affects their cravings, their behaviors. We live in a, we, we now we've inherited essentially a food environment that's become basically toxic. And so for me, it's not about counting calories or watching your macros or anything like that. It's about really kind of sticking to foods that are going to be the most satiating. And they're again, going to give you the most bang for your buck in terms of neuroprotective, cardioprotective molecules, like antioxidants, phytochemicals, things like that. And that has nothing to do with counting calories or calories in calories out when you're eating foods that are, you know, in their whole food form, minimally adulterated, minimally processed, then these foods are naturally going to regulate your hunger mechanisms. And that's something to me that I think is so important. We've got enough to worry about. We've got enough on our plates. You know, we're sitting there watching our bank accounts, you know, dwindle during this crazy time, you know? And so I think to focus on this sort of abstract and to be quite frank, unnatural construct calories, you know, the number of calories we consume, it just doesn't seem to make all that much sense when on the other hand, you can just sort of build your diet around foods that are going to be nourishing and that are going to fill you up naturally so that you don't have to think about calories. The other thing is like, you know, if you're an average weight person, essentially, unless you're a, a, a bodybuilder, you don't really have such a large calorie budget to consume foods that are not all that nutrient dense, like grains and, you know, and, you know, foods with lots of added sugars and things like that. We know that most people are nutrient deficient. 90% of people in the United States are deficient in at least one essential nutrient. So that just goes to show you that we're underfed, we're we're overfed and we're undernourished. Which is like a crazy paradox, which is the, the problem of our time in which, yeah, we have overconsumption, yet we're still undernourished, which is such a paradox. Exactly. So yeah, that's sort of my guiding philosophy. And then my guiding philosophy for life is just to be kind, to lead by example, to keep learning, you know, to, to continue learning and to just, you know, try to show up every day with a smile. That's what it's I wish about. more of us lived by those simple principles because I think yeah, our country is in a weird spot and hopefully uh, more of us think about being kind and and, and smiling and, and showing up with good intent. But we'll see what happens with kind of all the political, social unrest right now. It's definitely something top of mind, just given, I mean, how, how, almost how could you not have that at least come up on your radar if you're, unless you're completely disciplined like a monk or you're completely just uninformed and disentangled from news. It's definitely hard to, to, to like stay focused, I would say. And any tips or best practices in, in that from in terms of being kind, being grateful when there's probably rightly a lot of things to be upset about or, or be stressed about. You know, I think to some degree you have to kind of like limit your exposure to, to news and information. There's this wonderful quote from, I believe Duncan Trussell, who I don't really know anything about. I think he's a comedian. I I, (laughs) could be a fighter. I have no idea, but he said, there's this line, you know, some poor fool is probably sitting somewhere without a phone under a waterfall, not realizing how angry and afraid he should be. You know, and it's like a tongue in cheek, like, you know, sarcastic, sarcastic thing to kind of ponder that, like, you know, there's really no, I mean, there's, there's, there are a lot of injustices in the world, but when it comes to like you 
and you know the, the person listening to this the indiv- the individual that is listening to this you know you really ought to you owe it to yourself to your health to your loved ones to i don't know disconnect from you know from the media and to and to realize that life actually isn't that bad i mean you know for for everything that we're that we're being spoon fed from the media like you know you'd think that these these are the worst times we've ever lived in these are actually the best times that we've ever ever lived in. And, you know, we all have a lot of privilege. Like if you're listening to this podcast, if you're alive, you know, you are privileged. I see the word privilege thrown about so much now on social media, like almost weaponized, you know, and being used as a device to create further division. But, you know, unless you've sat with a dying person and I have, you know, the true privilege is that you are able to breathe on your own. And if you have that, if you're able to think for yourself, if you're not in a coma, then, you know, you have an incredible gift. You have a voice. You, you have agency in the world. You can use that voice. You can use that agency for good, you know, to, to show love, to, to affect change. And so, yeah, I don't know. I mean, the world has just become so inflamed lately, but I, yeah, I try not to let it get to me because I know that I'm putting out good stuff into the world. I'm, I, you know, every single day I share free content on my Instagram for people. (laughs) So, you know, it's just, uh, it's just kind of funny that, that there's all these like warring factions and I understand it to some degree, you know, but, uh, but yeah, I think, I think at the end of the day, you have to reserve time in the day to disconnect and to express gratitude for the fact that, you know, there, you know, no matter what you're facing in your own life, um, there, there has to be something that you can find to be grateful for. And you have to find that, identify that and use it to pull you through. And and I think a lot of the things you're talking about in terms of best practice, I think are just good practical tips in terms of keeping the world small for what you can directly control in certain contexts, right? Like one shouldn't feel like they need to carry the entire world's injustice on one's shoulder and change the world by yourself. Because oftentimes it's above our individual pay grade, right? Like you're not going to be able to do that if you spend one hour, two hours, 24 hours, the next year doing it. So sometimes you need to just like focus on yourself, make sure you're healthy, happy, productive. And then sometimes it is uh, important to, you know, fight for, you know, injustice in the world. But I think you have to like choose your spots and, and, and balance your personal happiness, productivity, health with taking the world's problem on your shoulders. And I think that is a kind of a balance that I think we need to be a little bit more thoughtful about. Because I think a lot of people almost forget about their own individual happiness, productivity, and health, and just take on the, 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 the war of the entire world. And it's like, I'm glad people like have that self-righteousness or responsibility to do such a thing. But oftentimes, one doesn't have like the credibility, reputation, power, position to even do anything about it. So one is just unproductive in, in that spot or powerless. So they just feel very disempowered or disenchanted. And it's like a negative feedback loop where if they were building up momentum and competency from the bottom up with themselves, with their community, with their neighborhood, you oftentimes see much more productivity and much more ultimate end result, right? It's just like, do you fight the world today or do you, or do you build up the building blocks from your, yourself first? And I think there's a little bit of different philosophies on what's the best way to actually approach injustice in the world. And it sounds like we all need to have a little bit of balance or at least perspective to not get caught up on the, the super negative side of things, which is so palatable for like the clickbait culture that we're in now. Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. I mean the media definitely, and I've worked in media for many years. It, it abides by the, if it bleeds, it leads philosophy. You know, they put the most fear and anxiety inducing content up front because it glues you to the screen, you know, and there's a neurobiological basis for that. I mean, it, it basically, it, it makes you afraid. And so there, there, there's an up leveling of neurotransmitters involved in focus and attention. And they do that because, you know, first of all, advertisers love it. They know that you're paying attention to the screen and it also gets you to watch all the way to the end. But that's not often reality. Like that's just not how uh, reality works. You know, if I, you know, drive around Los Angeles right now, I mean, it's actually pretty, pretty peaceful. But yeah, I don't want to diminish like, you know, the the struggles that, that people are going through. I know that it's a it's a sensitive time, but I just think that like the collective stress and anxiety, it's just not it's not helping the situation. You know, it's it's pouring fuel onto fire. And, you know, I think ultimately that you've got to kind of put yourself first to some degree and your loved ones first, you know, you've got to put your oxygen mask on first 
And by being the best, most informed, most giving and empathetic and understanding and healthiest version of you that you can be, you know, if that creates a ripple effect that then leads, you know, to your neighbors, to your friends, to your social groups, to, to, to doing the same thing. I mean, that's going to, that to me is ultimately what's going to lead to a better world. We're not going to, we're not going to get a better world by what's currently happening right now. Like I don't really see any improvement, you know, I see just a lot more division and name calling. Yeah. And that's just, you know, from my vantage point, but um, but I think others others feel the same yeah. way. And I wish I could be more optimistic on that front. But yeah, I, I, I see a similar kind of unfolding here. But not to end on a pessimistic <laughs> note here. I mean, I'm sure it sounds like you're busy with new discoveries, new experiments, new research, and probably, I imagine, a lot of new projects. So what are you looking forward to in the rest of the year? Any new projects, books? What's, you know, what's on the roadmap for 2020, 2021 for Max? Yeah, so this is not, I haven't yet really announced this. So this is kind of an exclusive, <laughs> but I'm, uh, I'm working on a cookbook. Okay. Um, so, so yeah, that is going to be super fun. I want it to be not just a recipe book, but, uh, you know, another sort of book that people can really sink their teeth into and learn from along with, you know, lots and lots of great recipes. I'm also leaning hard into the podcast that I have. It's called The Genius Life. We are going to be increasing output and like, you know, I'm, I'm excited for that just because it's a, you know, it's something that I never thought that I would enjoy as much as I do. And I do really love, love doing it. I'm sure you can relate and just continuing to, to, to learn and put out new information. I mean, it's like, you know, I've, I've seen, I've gone through the new, the nutrition obsession and I'm still very much, you know, into it, but it's like, there's like these different waves, you know? So now I'm like, you know, I've, I've discovered this nitric oxide thing and I'm just like obsessed with that. And, you know, it's all I want to read about. So I don't know what's next, but I just love that, that health and wellness, that it's really this like, bottomless well of of you know curiosity and and understanding and and information and yeah i just feel very like lucky to be doing what i'm doing and i like to i like to learn and then i like to teach because the best way to learn is to teach and so you know i like to i like to sort of wrap my head around these 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 concepts and then kind of chew them up digest them and make them uh make them approachable to a, to a wider audience. That's like a challenge, you know, that I, that I really quite enjoy. So continuing to find new avenues to do that. That's pretty much it. Yeah. Keep on the good fight. I think that's where I think I'm optimistic where there are more and more people that appreciate like long form conversations where you can actually have a conversation, flip around topics, poke holes in the arguments, and then just come up more wise. And I think if we, you know, not to make ourselves overly self-important here, but like hopefully if we can encourage more learning, more self-education, more long-form nuanced conversation that's hopefully going to help make our societies better. So, yeah, I love to, I mean, I'm excited to keep in touch and track along. I know that you're active on social, Max Lugavir are, are your handles. Any other shout outs in terms of links where our listeners can tune in, whether that's your podcast, your book, where, where are all the handles? Yeah, that's for the Genius Life podcast. Uh, my book is called Genius Foods, and I have I have two books. One is Genius Foods. One is The Genius Life. They're both great. You know, I know I'm biased, but you know, people they really have resonated with people around the world. So feel free to check those out. And yeah, you know, I'm active on Instagram, active on Twitter. Uh, love connecting with people. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Cool. I'm, uh, I'm an open book. Yeah, I'm an open book. All right. Well, we'll continue the conversation. Thanks, Max. And yeah, check out all his, his information, guys. All right. Thanks so much and talk to you soon.